Chapter 21 of Pushing to the Front by Horizon Sweat Martin. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Luke Sartor. Chapter 21 Enamored of Accuracy. Antonio Stradivari has an eye that winces at false work and loves the true. Accuracy is the twin brother of honesty. C. Simmons Genius is the infinite art of taking pains. Carlyle I hate a thing done by halves. If it be right, do it boldly. If it be wrong, leave it undone. Gilpin If I were a cobbler, it would be my pride, the best of all cobblers to be. If I were a tinker, no tinker beside should mend an old kettle like me. Old Song If a man can write a better book, preach a better sermon, or make a better mousetrap than his neighbor, though he build his house in the woods, the world will make a beaten path to his door. Emerson Sir, it is a watch which I have made and regulated myself, said George Graham of London, to a customer who asked how far he could depend upon its keeping correct time. Take it with you wherever you please. If after seven years you come back to see me, and can tell me there has been a difference of five minutes, I will return you your money. Seven years later the gentleman returned from India. Sir, said he, I bring you back your watch. I remember our conditions, said Graham. Let me see the watch. Well, what do you complain of? Why, said the man, I have had it seven years, and there is a difference of more than five minutes. Indeed, in that case I return you your money. I will not part with the watch, said the man, for ten times the sum I paid for it and I would not break my word for any consideration," replied Graham. So he paid the money and took the watch, which he used as a regulator. He learned his trade of Tampion, the most exquisite mechanic in London, if not in the world, whose name on a timepiece was considered proof positive of its excellence. When a person once asked him to repair a watch, upon which his name was fraudulently engraved, Tampion smashed it with a hammer and handed the astonished customer one of his own masterpieces, saying, Sir, here is a watch of my making. Graham invented the compensatory mercury pendulum, the deep escapement, and the orrery, none of which have been much improved since. The clock which he made for Greenwich Observatory has been running 150 years, yet it needs regulating but once in 15 months. Tampion and Graham lie in Westminster Abbey because of the accuracy of their work. To ensure safety, a navigator must know how far he is from the equator, north or south, and how far east or west of some known point as Greenwich, Paris, or Washington, he could be sure of this knowledge when the sun is shining. If he could have an absolutely accurate timekeeper, but such a thing has not yet been made. In the 16th century, Spain offered a prize of a thousand crowns for the discovery of an approximately correct method of determining longitude. About 200 years later, the English government offered 5,000 pounds for a chronometer by which a ship six months from home could get her longitude within 60 miles, 7,500 pounds if within 40 miles, 10,000 pounds if within 30 miles, and in another clause, 20,000 pounds for correctness within 30 miles, a careless repetition. The watchmakers of the world contested for the prizes. But 1761 came, and they had not been awarded. 
In that year, John Harrison asked for a test of his chronometer. In a trip of 147 days from Portsmouth to Jamaica and back, it varied less than two minutes, and only four seconds on the outward voyage. In a round trip of 156 days to Barbados, the variation was only 15 seconds. The 20,000 pounds was paid to the man who had worked and experimented for 40 years, and whose hand was as exquisitely delicate in its movement as the mechanism of his chronometer. Make me as good a hammer as you know how, said a carpenter to the blacksmith in a New York village before the first railroad was built. Six of us have come to work on the new church, and I've left mine at home. As good a one as I know how? asked David May Doyle, doubtfully. But perhaps you don't want to pay for as good a one as I know how to make. Yes, I do, said the carpenter. I want a good hammer. It was indeed a good hammer that he received, the best, probably, that had ever been made. By means of a longer hole than usual, David had wedged the handle in its place, so that the head could not fly off, a wonderful improvement in the eyes of the carpenter, who boasted of his prize to his companions. They all came to the shop next day, and each ordered just such a hammer. When the contractor saw the tools, he ordered two for himself, asking that they be made a little better than those of his men. I can't make any better ones, said May Doyle. When I make a thing, I make it as well as I can, no matter whom it is for. The storekeeper soon ordered two dozen, a supply unheard of in his previous business career. A New York dealer in tools came to the village to sell his wares and bought all the storekeeper had, and left a standing order for all the blacksmith could make. David might have grown very wealthy by making goods of the standard already attained, but throughout his long and successful life, he never ceased to study still further to perfect his hammers in the minutest detail. They were usually sold without any warrant of excellence. The word Maydoil stamped on the head being universally considered a guarantee of the best article the world could produce. Character is power, and is the best advertisement in the world. We have no secret, said the manager, of an iron works employing thousands of men. We always try to beat our last batch of rails. That is all the secret we've got, and we don't care who knows it. I don't try to see how cheap a machine I can produce, but how good a machine," said the late John C. Whitten of Northbridge, Massachusetts, to a customer who complained of the high price of some cotton machinery. Businessmen soon learned what this meant, and when there was occasion to advertise any machinery for sale, New England cotton manufacturers were accustomed to state the number of years it had been in use and add as an all-sufficient guarantee of Northbridge products, we didn't make. Madame, said the sculptor H.K. Brown, as he admired a statue in alabaster made by a youth in his teens, this boy has something in him. It was the figure of an Irishman who worked for the Ward family in Brooklyn years ago, and gave with minutest fidelity not merely the man's features and expression, but even the patches in his trousers, the rent in his coat, and the creases in his narrow-brimmed stovepipe hat. Mr. Brown saw the statue at the house of a lady living at Newburgh on the Hudson. Six years later, he invited her brother, J.Q.A. Ward, to become a pupil in his studio. Today, the name of Ward is that of the most prosperous of all American sculptors. Paint me just as I am, warts and all, said Oliver Cromwell to the artist, who, thinking to please the great man, had omitted a mole. I can remember when you blacked my father's shoes, 
said one member of the House of Commons to another in the heat of debate. True enough, was the prompt reply. But did I not black them well? It is easy to tell good indigo, said an old lady. Just take a lump and put it into water, and if it is good, it will either sink or swim. I am not sure which, but never mind, you can try it for yourself. John B. Goff told of a coloured preacher who, wishing his congregation to fresco the recess back of the pulpit, suddenly closed his Bible and said, There, my brethren, the gospel will not be dispensed with any more from this pulpit to a collection of sufficient to fricassee this abscess. When troubled with deafness, Wellington consulted a celebrated physician who put strong caustic into his ear, causing an inflammation which threatened his life. The doctor apologized, expressed great regrets, and said that the blunder would ruin him. No, said Wellington, I will never mention it. But you will allow me to attend you so that people will not withdraw their confidence? No, said the Iron Duke, that would be lying. Father, said a boy, I saw an immense number of dogs, 500, I am sure, in our street last night. Surely not so many, said the father. Well, there were 100, I'm quite sure. It could not be, said the father. I don't think there are 100 dogs in our village. Well, sir, it could not be less than 10, this I am quite certain of. I will not believe you saw ten even, said the father, for you spoke as confidently of seeing five hundred as of seeing this smaller number. You have contradicted yourself twice already, and now I cannot believe you. Well, sir, said the disconcerted boy, I saw at least our dash and another one. We condemn the boy for exaggerating in order to tell a wonderful story. But how much more truthful are they who never saw it rain so before, or who called day after day the hottest of the summer or the coldest of the winter? There is nothing which all mankind venerate and admire so much as simple truth, exempt from artifice, duplicity and design. It exhibits at once a strength of character and integrity of purpose, in which all are willing to confide. To say nice things merely to avoid giving offence, to keep silent rather than speak the truth, to equivocate, to evade, to dodge, to say what is expedient rather than what is truthful, to shirk the truth, to face both ways, to exaggerate, to seem to concur with another's opinions when you do not, to deceive by a glance of the eye, a nod of the head, a smile, a gesture, to lack sincerity, to assume to know or think or feel what you do not. All these are but various manifestations of hollowness and falsehood resulting from want of accuracy. We find no lying, no inaccuracy, no slipshod business in nature. Roses blossom and crystals form with the same precision of tint and angle today as in Eden on the morning of creation. The rose in the Queen's garden is not more beautiful, more fragrant, more exquisitely perfect than that which blooms and blushes unheeded amid the fern-decked brush by the roadside, or in some far-off glen where no human eye ever sees it. The crystal found deep in the earth is constructed with the same fidelity as that formed above ground. Even the tiny snowflake whose destiny is to become an apparently insignificant and a wholly unnoticed part of an enormous bank assumes its shape of ethereal beauty as faithfully as though preparing for some grand exhibition. Planets rush with dizzy sweep through almost limitless courses, yet return to equinox or solstice at the appointed second, their very movement being the uniform manifestation of the will of God. The marvelous resources and growth of America 
have developed an unfortunate tendency to overstate, overdraw, and exaggerate. It seems strange that there should be so strong a temptation to exaggerate in a country where the truth is more wonderful than fiction. The positive is stronger than the superlative, but we ignore this fact in our speech. Indeed, it is really difficult to ascertain the exact truth in America. How many American fortunes are built on misrepresentation that is needless, for nothing else is half so strong as truth. Does the devil lie? was asked of Sir Thomas Brown. No, for then even he could not exist. Truth is necessary to permanency. In Siberia, a traveler found men who could see the satellites of Jupiter with the naked eye. These men have made little advance in civilization, yet they are far superior to us in their accuracy of vision. It is a curious fact that not a single astronomical discovery of importance has been made through a large telescope. The men who have advanced our knowledge of that science, the most working, with ordinary instruments backed by most accurately trained minds and eyes. A double convex lens, three feet in diameter, is worth $60,000. Its adjustment is so delicate that the human hand is the only instrument thus far known suitable for giving the final polish. And one sweep of the hand, more than is needed, Alvin Clark says, would impair the correctness of the glass. During the test of the great glass which he made for Russia, the workmen turned it a little with their hands. Wait, boys, let it cool before making another trial, said Clark. The poise is so delicate that the heat from your hands affects it. Mr. Clark's love of accuracy has made his name a synonym of exactness the world over. No, I can't do it. It is impossible, said Webster, when urged to speak on a question soon to come up, toward the close of a congressional session. I am so pressed with other duties that I haven't time to prepare myself to speak upon that theme. Ah, but Mr. Webster, you always speak well upon any subject. You never fail. But that's the very reason, said the orator because I never allow myself to speak upon any subject without first making that subject thoroughly my own. I haven't time to do that in this instance. Hence, I must refuse. Rufus Choate would plead before a shoemaker, justice of the peace, in a petty case, with all the fervor and careful attention to detail with which he addressed the United States Supreme Court. Whatever is right to do, said an eminent writer, should be done with our best care, strength, and faithfulness of purpose. We have no scales by which we can weigh our faithfulness to duties or determine their relative importance in God's eyes. That which seems a trifle to us may be the secret spring which shall move the issues of life and death. There goes a man that has been to hell, the Florentines would say when Dante passed. So realistic seemed to them his description of the netherworld. There is only one real failure in life possible, said Canon Farrar, and that is not to be true to the best one knows. It is quite astonishing, Grove said of Beethoven, to find the length of time during which some of the best known instrumental melodies remained in his thoughts till they were finally used, or the crude, vague, commonplace shape in which they were first written down. The more they are elaborated, the more fresh and spontaneous they become. Leonardo da Vinci would walk across Milan to change a single tint or the slightest detail in his famous picture of the Last Supper. Every line was then written twice over by Pope. 
said his publisher, Dodsley, of manuscript brought to be copied. Gibbon wrote his memoir nine times, and the first chapters of his history eighteen times. Of one of his works, Montesquieu said to a friend, You will read it in a few hours, but I assure you it has cost me so much labor that it has whitened my hair. He had made it his study by day and his dream by night, the alpha and omega of his aims and objects. He who does not write as well as he can on every occasion, said George Ripley, will soon form the habit of not writing well on any occasion. An accomplished entomologist thought he would perfect his knowledge by a few lessons under Professor Agassiz. The latter handed him a dead fish and told him to use his eyes. Two hours later, he examined his new pupil, but soon remarked, You haven't really looked at the fish yet. You'll have to try again. After a second examination, he shook his head, saying, You do not show that you can use your eyes. This roused the pupil to earnest effort, and he became so interested in things he had never noticed before that he did not see Agassiz when he came for the third examination. That will do, said the great scientist. I now see that you can use your eyes. Reynolds said he could go on retouching a picture forever. The captain of a Nantucket whaler told the man at the wheel to steer by the North Star, but was awakened towards morning by a request for another star to steer by, as they had sailed by the other. Stephen Gerard was precision itself. He did not allow those in his employ to deviate in the slightest degree from his ironclad orders. He believed that no great success is possible without the most rigid accuracy in everything. He did not vary from a promise in the slightest degree. People knew that his word was not pretty good, but absolutely good. He left nothing to chance. Every detail of business was calculated and planned to a nicety. He was as exact and precise, even in the smallest trifles, as Napoleon. Yet his brother merchants attributed his superior success to good luck. In 1805, Napoleon broke up the great camp he had formed on the shores of the English Channel and gave orders for his mighty host to defile towards the Danube. Vast and various as were the projects fermenting in his brain, however, he did not content himself with giving the order and leaving the elaboration of its details to his lieutenants. To details and minutia, which inferior captains would have deemed too microscopic for their notice, he gave such exhaustive attention that before the bugle had sounded for the march, he had planned the exact route which every regiment was to follow the exact day and hour it was to leave that station, and the precise moment when it was to reach its destination. These details, so thoroughly pre-mediated, were carried out to the letter, and the result of that memorable march was the victory of Austerlitz, which sealed the fate of Europe for ten years. When a noted French preacher speaks in Notre Dame, the scholars of Paris throng the cathedral to hear his fascinating, eloquent, polished discourses. This brilliant finish is the result of most patient work, as he delivers but five or six sermons a year. When Sir Walter Scott visited a ruined castle about which he wished to write, he wrote in a notebook the separate names of grasses and wild flowers growing near saying that only by such means can a writer be natural. The historian, Macaulay, never allowed a sentence to stand until it was as good as he could make it. Besides his scrapbooks, Garfield had a large case of some fifty pigeonholes, labelled anecdotes, electoral laws and commissions, French spoliation, 
General Politics, Geneva Award, Parliamentary Decisions, Public Men, State Politics, Tariff, The Press, United States History, etc. Every valuable hint he could get being preserved in the cold exactness of black and white. When he chose to make careful preparation on a subject, no other speaker could command so great an array of facts. Accurate people are methodical people, and method means character. I'm offered 10,000 bushels wheat on your account at one dollar. Shall I buy, or is it too high? telegraphed a San Francisco merchant to one in Sacramento. No price too high, came back over the wire, instead of, no, price too high, as was intended. The omission of a period cost the Sacramento dealer one thousand dollars. How many thousands have lost their wealth or lives? And how many frightful accidents have occurred through carelessness in sending messages. The accurate boy is always the favored one, said President Tuttle. Those who employ men do not wish to be on the constant lookout, as though they were rogues or fools. If a carpenter must stand at his journeyman's elbow to be sure his work is right, or if a cashier must run over his bookkeeper's columns he might as well do the work himself as employ another to do it in that way. And it is very certain that the employer will get rid of such a blunderer as soon as he can. If you make a good pin, said a successful manufacturer, you will earn more than if you make a bad steam engine. There are women, said Fields, whose stitches always come out, and the buttons they sew on fly off on the mildest provocation. There are other women who use the same needle and thread, and you may tug away at their work on your coat or waistcoat, and you can't start a button in a generation. Carelessness, indifference, slouchiness, slipshod financiering could truthfully be written over the graves of thousands who have failed in life. How many clerks, cashiers, clergymen, editors, and professors in college have lost position and prestige by carelessness and inaccuracy. You would be the greatest man of your age, Gratan, said Curan, if you would buy a few yards of red tape and tie up your bills and papers. Curan realized that methodical people are accurate and, as a rule, successful. Berg tells of a man, beginning business, who opened and shut his shop regularly at the same hour every day for weeks, without selling two cents worth, yet whose application attracted attention and paved the way to fortune. A. T. Stewart was extremely systematic and precise in all his transactions. Method ruled in every department of his store, and for every delinquency a penalty was rigidly enforced. His eye was upon his business and all its ramifications. He mastered every detail and worked hard. From the time Jonas Chickering began to work for a piano maker, he was noted for the pains and care with which he did everything. To him there were no trifles in the manufacturing of pianos. Neither time nor labor was of any account to him, compared with accuracy and knowledge. He soon made pianos in a factory of his own. He determined to make an instrument yielding the fullest and richest volume of melody with the least exertion to the player, withstanding atmospheric changes and preserving its purity and truthfulness of tone. He resolved that each piano should be an improvement upon the one which preceded it. Perfection was his aim. To the end of his life he gave the finishing touch to each of his instruments and would trust it to no one else. He permitted no irregularity in workmanship or sales, and was characterized by simplicity, transparency, and straightforwardness. He distanced all competitors. 
Chickering's name was such a power that one piano maker had his name changed to Chickering by the Massachusetts legislature and put it on his pianos. But Jonas Chickering sent a petition to the legislature and the name was changed back. Character has a commercial as well as an ethical value. Joseph M. W. Turner was intended by his father for a barber, but he showed such a taste for drawing that a reluctant permission was given for him to follow art as a profession. He soon became skillful, but as he lacked means, he took anything to do that came in his way, frequently illustrating guidebooks and almanacs. But although the pay was very small, the work was never careless. His labor was worth several times what he received for it, but the price was increased, and work of higher grade given him simply because men seek the services of those who are known to be faithful, and employ them in as lofty work as they seem able to do. And so he toiled upward, until he began to employ himself, his work sure of a market at some price, and the price increasing as other men began to get glimpses of the transcendent art revealed in his paintings an art not fully comprehended even in our day. He surpassed the acknowledged masters in various fields of landscape work, and left matchless studies of natural scenery in lines never before attempted. What Shakespeare is in literature, Turner is in his special field, the greatest name on record. The demand for perfection in the nature of Wendell Phillips was wonderful. Every word must exactly express the shade of his thought. Every phrase must be of due length and cadence. Every sentence must be perfectly balanced before it left his lips. Exact precision characterized his style. He was easily the first forensic orator America has produced. The rhythmic fullness and poise of his periods are remarkable. Alexandre Dumas prepared his manuscript with the greatest care. When consulted by a friend whose article had been rejected by several publishers, he advised him to have it handsomely copied by a professional penman, and then changed the title. The advice was taken, and the article eagerly accepted by one of the very publishers who had refused it before. Many able essays have been rejected because of poor penmanship. We must strive after accuracy, as we would after wisdom, or hidden treasure, or anything we would attain. Determine to form exact business habits. Avoid slipshod financiering, as you would the plague. Careless and indifferent habits would soon ruin a millionaire. Nearly every very successful man is accurate and painstaking. Accuracy means character, and character is power. End of chapter 21 Enamored of Accuracy Recording by Luke Sartor, Brisbane, Queensland